The history of immigration to the United States details the movement of people to the United States starting with the first European settlements from around 1600. Beginning around this time, British and other Europeans settled primarily on the East Coast. In 1619, Africans began being imported as slaves. The United States experienced successive waves of immigration, particularly from Europe. Immigrants sometimes paid the cost of transoceanic transportation by becoming indentured servants after their arrival in the New World. Later, immigration rules became more restrictive. The ending of numerical restrictions occurred in 1965. Recently, cheap air travel has increased immigration from Asia and Latin America. Attitudes towards new immigrants have cycled between favorable and hostile since the 1790s. Topic: Colonial Era. In 1607, the first successful English colony settled in Jamestown, Virginia. Once tobacco was found to be a profitable cash crop, many plantations were established along the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia and Maryland. Thus began the first and longest era of immigration, lasting until the American Revolution in 1775. During this time, settlements grew from initial English tow holds from the New World to British America. It brought Northern European immigrants, primarily of British, German, and Dutch extraction. The British ruled from the mid 17th century and they were by far the largest group of arrivals, remaining within the British Empire. Over 90% of these early immigrants became farmers, large numbers of young men and women came alone as indentured servants. Their passage was paid by employers in the colonies who needed help on the farms or in shops. Indentured servants were provided food, housing, clothing and training but they did not receive wages. At the end of the indenture usually around age 21, they were free to marry and start their own farms. Topic New England Seeking religious freedom in the New World, 100 English pilgrims established a small settlement near Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620. Tens of thousands of English Puritans arrived, mostly from the East Anglian parts of England Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, as well as Kent and East Sussex, and settled in Boston, Massachusetts and adjacent areas from around 1629 to 1640 to create a land dedicated to their religion. The earliest New English colonies, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire, were established along the northeast coast. Large-scale immigration to this region ended before 1700, though a small but steady trickle of later arrivals continued. The New English colonists were the most urban and educated of all their contemporaries, and they had many skilled farmers, tradesmen and craftsmen among them. They started the first university, Harvard, in 1635 in order to train their ministers. They mostly settled in small villages for mutual support nearly all of them had their own militias and common religious activities. Shipbuilding, commerce, agriculture, and fishing were their main sources of income. New England's healthy climate the cold winters killed the mosquitoes and other disease-bearing insects, small widespread villages minimizing the spread of disease, and an abundant food supply resulted in the lowest death rate and the highest birth rate of any of the colonies. The eastern and northern frontier around the initial New England settlements was mainly settled by the descendants of the original New Englanders. Immigration to the New England colonies after 1640 and the start of the English Civil War decreased to less than 1% about equal to the death rate in nearly all of the years prior to 1845. The rapid growth of the New England colonies approximately 900,000 by 1790 was almost entirely due to the high birth rate greater than 3% and the low death rate. Dutch The Dutch, primarily driven by the United East Indian Company, first established settlements along the Hudson River in New York starting about 1626. Wealthy Dutch patroons set up large landed estates along the Hudson River and brought in farmers who became renters. Others established rich trading posts to trade with Native Americans and started cities such as New Amsterdam now New York City and Albany, New York. After the British took over and renamed the colony New York, Germans from the Palatinate, and Yankees from New England began arriving. <inaudible> Middle colonies Maryland, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware formed the Middle colonies. 
Pennsylvania was settled by Quakers from Britain, followed by Ulster Scots Northern Ireland on the frontier and numerous German Protestant sects, including the German Palatines. The earlier colony of New Sweden had small settlements on the lower Delaware River, with immigrants of Swedes and Finns. These colonies were absorbed by 1676. The middle colonies were scattered west of New York City, established 1626, taken over by the English in 1664, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, established 1682. The initial Dutch colony of New York had the most eclectic collection of residents from many different nations and prospered as a major trading and commercial center after about 1700. From around 1680 to 1725, the Pennsylvania Colonial Center was dominated by the Quakers for decades after they emigrated, mainly from the North Midlands of England. During this time, the main commercial center of Philadelphia was run mostly by prosperous Quakers, supplemented by many small farming and trading communities, with a strong German contingent located in several small towns in the Delaware River Valley. Starting around 1680, when Pennsylvania was founded, many more settlers arrived to the Middle Colonies. Many Protestant sects were encouraged to settle there for freedom of religion and good, cheap land. Their origins were about 60% British and 33% German. By 1780, New York's population were around 27% descendants of Dutch settlers, about 6% were African, and the remainder were mostly English with a wide mixture of other Europeans. New Jersey, and Delaware had a British majority, with 7-11% German descendants, about 6% African population, and a small contingent of the Swedish descendants of New Sweden. Frontier The colonial frontier was mainly settled from about 1717 to 1775. These were mostly Presbyterian settlers from North England border lands, Scotland, and Ulster, fleeing hard times and religious persecution. The fourth major centre of settlement was the Western Frontier, located in the western parts of Pennsylvania and in the south, which was settled during the early to late 18th century by mostly Scots-Irish, with others mostly from North England border lands. Some French Huguenots and Germans were also present. Between 250,000 and 400,000 Scotch-Irish migrated to America in the 18th century. The Scotch-Irish soon became the dominant culture of the Appalachians from Pennsylvania to Georgia. Areas where people reported American ancestry were the places where, historically, Northern English, Scottish and Scotch-Irish Protestants settled, in the interior of the South, and the Appalachian region. Scotch-Irish American immigrants, were made up of people from the southernmost counties of Scotland who had initially settled in Ireland. They were heavily Presbyterian, and largely self-sufficient. The Scotch-Irish arrived in large numbers during the early 18th century and they often preferred to settle in the back country and the frontier from Pennsylvania to Georgia, where they mingled with second generation and later English settlers. They enjoyed the very cheap land and independence from established governments common to frontier settlements. Often, the main port of entry for these immigrants was Philadelphia, after which they or, in many cases, their descendants migrated west and south. <laughs> Southern colonies The mostly agricultural Southern English colonies initially had very high death rates for new settlers due to malaria, yellow fever, and other diseases as well as skirmishes with Native Americans. Despite this, a steady flow of new settlers, mostly from central England and the London area, kept up population growth. Initially, the large plantations were mostly owned by friends mostly minor aristocrats of the British appointed governors. A group of Gaelic-speaking Scottish Highlanders created a settlement at Cape Fear in North Carolina, which remained culturally distinct until the mid-18th century, at which point it was swallowed up by the dominant English origin culture. Many settlers arrived as indentured servants who had to work off their passage with five to seven years of work for room and board, clothing, and training, but no cash wages. After their terms of indentures expired, most of the indentures settled small farms on the frontier. The southern colonies were about 55% British, 38% Black, and roughly 7% German. The Atlantic slave trade primarily ceased after 1775 and it was outlawed in 1808, although some slaves were smuggled in afterwards. 
After 1630, the initial areas of settlement had been largely cleared of Native Americans by major outbreaks of measles, smallpox, and bubonic plague beginning decades before the settlers began arriving in large numbers. The leading killer was smallpox, which arrived in the New World around 1510–1530. Characteristics <laughs> 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 While the thirteen colonies differentiated in how they were settled and by whom, they had many commonalities. Nearly all were settled and financed by privately organized British settlers or families using free enterprise without any significant English royal or parliamentary government support or input. Nearly all commercial activity was run in small, privately owned businesses with good credit both at home and in England, which was essential since they were often cash poor. Most settlements were nearly independent of British trade since they grew or made nearly everything they needed. The average cost of imports per household was 5 to 15 pounds per year. Most settlements were created by complete family groups with several generations often present. The population was typically rural, with close to 80% owning the land they lived and farmed on. After 1700, as the Industrial Revolution progressed, more of the population started to move to cities, much like what had happened in Britain. Initially, the Dutch and German Americans primarily spoke dialects brought over from Europe, while English was the main trade language. Governments and laws primarily copied the English. The only major British institution to be abandoned was the aristocracy, noted by nearly universal absence. The settlers generally established their own popularly elected governments and courts on as many levels as they could and were nearly all, within a few years, self-governing, self-supporting, and self-replicating. This self-ruling pattern became so ingrained that almost all new settlements would have their own government up and running shortly after arrival for the next 200 years. After the colonies were initially settled, their population growth was made up almost entirely of natural growth with foreign-born immigrant populations rarely exceeding 10% except in isolated instances. The last significant colonies to be settled primarily by immigrants were Pennsylvania 1680s plus, the Carolinas 1663 plus, and Georgia 1732 plus. Even here the immigrants came mostly from England and Scotland with the exception of a large Germanic contingent to Pennsylvania. Elsewhere internal American migration from other colonies provided nearly all of the settlers for each new colony or state. Populations grew by about 80% at a 3% natural annual growth rate sustained over a 20-year interval. Over half of all new British immigrants in the South initially arrived as indentured servants. They were mostly poor young people who could not find work in England and could not afford passage to America. In addition, about 60,000 British convicts were transported to the British colonies in the 18th century. Most of these so-called convicts were guilty of being very poor and out of work. Serious. Criminals were generally executed. Ironically, these convicts are often the only immigrants with nearly complete immigration records as other immigrants typically showed up with few or no records. <laughs> other colonies <laughs> Spanish Although Spain set up a few forts in Florida, notably San Agustin present-day St. Augustine in 1565, they sent few settlers to Florida. Spaniards moving north from Mexico founded the San Juan on the Rio Grande in 1598, and Santa Fe in 1607-1608. The settlers were forced to leave temporarily for 12 years by the Pueblo Revolt before returning. Spanish Texas lasted from 1690 to 1821 when Texas was governed as a colony which was separate from New Spain. In 1731, Canary Islanders or Isleños arrived to establish San Antonio. The majority of the few hundred Texan and New Mexican colonizers in the Spanish colonial period were Spaniards and Criollos. California, New Mexico, and Arizona all had Spanish settlements. In 1781 Spanish settlers founded Los Angeles. At the time they joined the U.S., Californios in California numbered about 10,000 and Tejanos in Texas about 4,000. New Mexico had 47,000 Spanish settlers in 1842. Arizona was only thinly settled. 
However, not all these settlers were of European descent. As in the rest of the American colonies, new settlements were based on the casta system, and although all could speak Spanish, it was really a melting pot of whites, natives, and mestizos. French In the late 17th century, French expeditions established a foothold on the St. Lawrence River, Mississippi River, and Gulf Coast. Interior trading posts, forts, and cities were thinly spread throughout Louisiana such as St. Louis, Baton Rouge, Sault Ste. Marie, Prairie du Rocher, and St. Genevieve. The city of Detroit was the third largest settlement in New France. New Orleans expanded when several thousand French-speaking refugees from the region of Acadia now Nova Scotia, Canada made their way to Louisiana following British expulsion, settling largely in the southwest Louisiana region now called Acadiana. Their descendants are now called Cajun and still dominate the coastal areas. It is estimated that 7,000 European immigrants settled in Louisiana during the 18th century. Population in 1790 The following were the countries of origin for new arrivals to the United States before 1790. The regions marked with an asterisk were part of Great Britain. The ancestry of the 3.9 million population in 1790 has been estimated by various sources by sampling last names from the 1790 census and assigning them a country of origin. The Irish in the 1790 census were mostly Scotch-Irish. The French were primarily Huguenots. The total U.S. Catholic population in 1790 was probably less than 5%. The Native American population inside territorial U.S. boundaries was less than 100,000. The 1790 population reflected the loss of approximately 46,000 Loyalists, or Tories who immigrated to Canada at the end of the American Revolution, 10,000 who went to England and 6,000 to the Caribbean. The USA of 1790 recorded 3.9 million inhabitants not counting American Indians. Of the total white population of just under 3.2 million in 1790, 85% was of British ancestry 60% were English or 1.9 million. 4.3% Welsh, 5.4% Scots, Irish South, 5.8%, Scots Irish 10.5%, Germans were 9%, Dutch 3.4%, French 2.1% and Swedish 0.25%, Blacks made up 19.3% or 762,000 The American Revolution, Colin Bonwick, 1991, p. 254 ISBN 0-8139-1364-2 Quoting from the 1980 study by Thomas Purvis, The European Ancestry of the United States Population, 1790, William and Mary Quarterly, 3rd SCR. 41, 980. The number of Scots was 200,000, Irish and Scot-Irish 625,000. The overwhelming majority of Southern Irish were Protestant as there were only 60,000 Catholics in the USA in 1790, 1.6% of the population. Many were descendants of English Catholic settlers in the 17th century. The rest were Irish, German and some Acadians who remained. In this era the population roughly doubled mostly due to natural increase every 23 years. Relentless population expansion pushed the U.S. frontier to the Pacific by 1848. Most immigrants came long distances to settle in the U.S. However, many Irish left Canada for the U.S. in the 1840s. French Canadians who came down from Quebec after 1860 and the Mexicans who came north after 1911 found it easier to move back and forth. Topic: 1790 to 1849. There was relatively little immigration from 1770 to 1830, while there was significant emigration from the U.S. to Canada, including about 75,000 Loyalists as well as Germans and others looking for better farmland in what is now Ontario. Large-scale immigration resumed in the 1830s from Britain, Ireland, Germany, and other parts of Central Europe as well as Scandinavia. Most were attracted by the cheap farmland. Some were artisans and skilled factory workers attracted by the first stage of industrialization. The Irish Catholics were primarily unskilled workers who built a majority of the canals and railroads, settling in urban areas. 
Many Irish went to the emerging textile mill towns of the Northeast, while others became longshoremen in the growing Atlantic and Gulf port cities. Half the Germans headed to farms, especially in the Midwest with some to Texas, while the other half became craftsmen in urban areas. Nativism took the form of political anti-Catholicism directed mostly at the Irish as well as Germans. It became important briefly in the mid-1850s in the guise of the Know Nothing Party. Most of the Catholics and German Lutherans became Democrats, and most of the other Protestants joined the new Republican Party. During the Civil War, ethnic communities supported the war and produced large numbers of soldiers on both sides. Riots broke out in New York City and other Irish and German strongholds in 1863 when a draft was instituted, particularly in light of the provision exempting those who could afford payment. Based on available records, immigration totaled 8,385 in 1820, with immigration totals gradually increasing to 23,322 by the year 1830. For the 1820s decade immigration more than doubled to 143,000. Between 1831 and 1840, immigration more than quadrupled to a total of 599,000. These included about 207,000 Irish, starting to emigrate in large numbers following Britain's easing of travel restrictions, and about 152,000 Germans, 76,000 British, and 46,000 French, constituting the next largest immigrant groups of the decade. Between 1841 and 1850, immigration nearly tripled again, totaling 1,713,000 immigrants, including at least 781,000 Irish, 435,000 Germans, 267,000 British, and 77,000 French. The Irish, driven by the Potato Famine 1845 emigrated directly from their homeland to escape poverty and death. The failed revolutions of 1848 brought many intellectuals and activists to exile in the U.S. Bad times and poor conditions in Europe drove people out, while land, relatives, freedom, opportunity, and jobs in the U.S. lured them in. Starting in 1820, some federal records, including ship passenger lists, were kept for immigration purposes, and a gradual increase in immigration was recorded. More complete immigration records provide data on immigration after 1830. Though conducted since 1790, the census of 1850 was the first in which place of birth was asked specifically. The foreign-born population in the U.S. likely reached its minimum around 1815, at approximately 100,000 or 1% of the population. By 1815, most of the immigrants who arrived before the American Revolution had died, and there had been almost no new immigration thereafter. Nearly all population growth up to 1830 was by internal increase, around 98% of the population was native-born. By 1850, this shifted to about 90% native-born. The first significant Catholic immigration started in the mid-1840s, shifting the population from about 95% Protestant down to about 90% by 1850. In 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, concluding the Mexican War, extended U.S. citizenship to approximately 60,000 Mexican residents of the New Mexico Territory and 10,000 living in California. An additional approximate 2,500 foreign-born California residents also become U.S. citizens. In 1849, the California Gold Rush attracted 100,000 would-be miners from the eastern U.S., Latin America, China, Australia, and Europe. California became a state in 1850 with a population of about 90,000. Topic: 1850 to 1930. Topic: Demography. Between 1850 and 1930, about 5 million Germans migrated to the United States, peaking between 1881 and 1885 when a million Germans settled primarily in the Midwest. Between 1820 and 1930, 3.5 million British and 4.5 million Irish entered America. Before 1845 most Irish immigrants were Protestants. After 1845, Irish Catholics began arriving in large numbers, largely driven by the Great Famine. After 1880, larger steam powered ocean going ships replaced sailing ships, which resulted in lower fares and greater immigrant mobility. In addition, the expansion of a railroad system in Europe made it easier for people to reach oceanic ports to board ships. 
Meanwhile, farming improvements in southern Europe and the Russian Empire created surplus labor. Young people between the ages of 15 to 30 were predominant among newcomers. This wave of migration, constituting the third episode in the history of U.S. immigration, may be better referred to as a flood of immigrants, as nearly 25 million Europeans made the long trip. Italians, Greeks, Hungarians, Poles, and others speaking Slavic languages made up the bulk of this migration. 2.5 to 4 million Jews were among them. Destinations Each group evinced a distinctive migration pattern in terms of the gender balance within the migratory pool, the permanence of their migration, their literacy rates, the balance between adults and children, and the like. But they shared one overarching characteristic, they flocked to urban destinations and made up the bulk of the U.S. industrial labor pool, making possible the emergence of such industries as steel, coal, automotive, textile, and garment production, enabling the United States to leap into the front ranks of the world's economic giants. Their urban destinations, numbers, and perhaps an antipathy towards foreigners, led to the emergence of a second wave of organized xenophobia. By the 1890s, many Americans, particularly from the ranks of the well-off, white, and native-born, considered immigration to pose a serious danger to the nation's health and security. In 1893 a group formed the Immigration Restriction League, and it, along with other similarly inclined organizations, began to press Congress for severe curtailment of foreign immigration. Irish and German Catholic immigration was opposed in the 1850s by the nativist, Know Nothing movement, originating in New York in 1843 as the American Republican Party not to be confused with the modern Republican Party. It was empowered by popular fears that the country was being overwhelmed by Catholic immigrants, who were often regarded as hostile to American values and controlled by the Pope in Rome. Active mainly from 1854 to 56, it strove to curb immigration and naturalization, though its efforts met with little success. There were few prominent leaders, and the largely middle class and Protestant membership fragmented over the issue of slavery, most often joining the Republican Party by the time of the 1860 presidential election. European immigrants joined the Union Army in large numbers, including 177,000 born in Germany and 144,000 born in Ireland. Many Germans could see the parallels between slavery and serfdom in the old fatherland. Between 1840 and 1930, about 900,000 French Canadians left Quebec in order to immigrate to the United States and settle, mainly in New England. Considering the fact that the population of Quebec was only 892,061 in 1851, this was a massive exodus. 13.6 million Americans claimed to have French ancestry in the 1980 census. A large portion of them have ancestors who emigrated from French Canada, since immigration from France was low throughout the history of the United States. During the same period almost 4 million other Canadians immigrated to the U.S. In the New England states 12% of the population can trace its ancestry back to Quebec and 10% can trace its ancestry back to the Maritime Provinces. Shortly after the U.S. Civil War, some states started to pass their own immigration laws, which prompted the U.S. Supreme Court to rule in 1875 that immigration was a federal responsibility. In 1875, the nation passed its first immigration law, the Page Act of 1875, also known as the Asian Exclusion Act, outlawing the importation of Asian contract laborers, any Asian woman who would engage in prostitution, and all people considered to be convicts in their own countries. In 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. By excluding all Chinese laborers from entering the country, the Chinese Exclusion Act severely curtailed the number of immigrants of Chinese descent allowed into the United States for ten years. The law was renewed in 1892 and 1902. During this period, Chinese migrants illegally entered the United States through the loosely guarded U.S.-Canadian border. Prior to 1890, the individual states, rather than the federal government, regulated immigration into the United States. The Immigration Act of 1891 established a Commissioner of Immigration in the Treasury Department. The Canadian Agreement of 1894 extended U.S. immigration restrictions to Canadian ports. The Dillingham Commission was set up by Congress in 1907 to investigate the effects of immigration on the country. The Commission's 40 volume analysis of immigration during the previous three decades led it to conclude that the major source of immigration had shifted from Central, Northern, and Western Europeans to Southern Europeans and Russians. 
It was, however, apt to make generalizations about regional groups that were subjective and failed to differentiate between distinct cultural attributes. The 1910s marked the high point of Italian immigration to the United States. Over 2 million Italians immigrated in those years, with a total of 5.3 million between 1880 and 1920. About half returned to Italy. After working an average of five years in the U.S., about 1.5 million Swedes and Norwegians immigrated to the United States within this period, due to opportunity in America and poverty and religious oppression in United Sweden Norway. This accounted for around 20% of the total population of the kingdom at that time. They settled mainly in the Midwest, especially Minnesota and the Dakotas. Danes had comparably low immigration rates due to a better economy. After 1900, many Danish immigrants were Mormon converts who moved to Utah. Over two million Central Europeans, mainly Catholics and Jews, immigrated between 1880 and 1924. People of Polish ancestry are the largest Central European ancestry group in the United States after Germans. Immigration of Eastern Orthodox ethnic groups was much lower. Lebanese and Syrian immigrants started to settle in large numbers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The vast majority of the immigrants from Lebanon and Syria were Christians, but smaller numbers of Jews, Muslims, and Druze also settled. Many lived in New York City's Little Syria and in Boston. In the 1920s and 1930s, a large number of these immigrants set out west, with Detroit getting a large number of Middle Eastern immigrants, as well as many Midwestern areas where the Arabs worked as farmers. From 1880 to 1924, around two million Jews moved to the United States, mostly seeking better opportunity in America and fleeing the pogroms of the Russian Empire. After 1934 Jews, along with any other above-quota immigration, were usually denied access to the United States. Congress passed a literacy requirement in 1917 to curb the influx of low-skilled immigrants from entering the country. Congress passed the Emergency Quota Act in 1921, followed by the Immigration Act of 1924, which was aimed at further restricting the Southern Europeans and Russians who had begun to enter the country in large numbers beginning in the 1890s. This ultimately resulted in precluding all extra Immigration to the United States, including Jews fleeing Nazi German persecution. The Immigration Act of 1924 set quotas for European immigrants so that no more than 2% of the 1890 immigrant stocks were allowed into America. <laughs> New immigration New immigration was a term from the late 1880s that came from the influx of Catholic and Jewish immigrants from Italy and Russia areas that previously sent few immigrants. Though the majority of immigrants came through New York, thus making the Northeast a major target of settlement, there were various efforts, such as the Galveston movement, to redirect immigrants to other ports and disperse some of the settlement to other areas of the country. Nativists feared the new arrivals lacked the political, social, and occupational skills needed to successfully assimilate into American culture. This raised the issue of whether the U.S. was still a melting pot, or if it had just become a dumping ground, and many old stock Americans worried about negative effects on the economy, politics, and culture. A major proposal was to impose a literacy test, whereby applicants had to be able to read and write in their own language before they were admitted. Topic: 1930 to 2000. Restriction proceeded piecemeal over the course of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but immediately after the end of World War I (1914 to 18) and into the early 1920s, Congress changed the nation's basic policy about immigration. The National Origins Formula of 1921 and its final form in 1924 not only restricted the number of immigrants who might enter the United States, but also assigned slots according to quotas based on national origins. A complicated piece of legislation, it essentially gave preference to immigrants from Central, Northern and Western Europe, severely limiting the numbers from Russia and Southern Europe, and declared all potential immigrants from Asia unworthy of entry into the United States. The legislation excluded the Western Hemisphere from the quota system, and the 1920s ushered in the penultimate era of U.S. immigration history. Immigrants could and did move quite freely from Mexico, the Caribbean including Jamaica, Barbados, and Haiti, and other parts of Central and South America. 
This era, which reflected the application of the 1924 legislation, lasted until 1965. During those 40 years, the United States began to admit, case by case, limited numbers of refugees. Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany before World War II, Jewish Holocaust survivors after the war, non-Jewish displaced persons fleeing communist rule in Central Europe and Russia, Hungarians seeking refuge after their failed uprising in 1956, and Cubans after the 1960 revolution managed to find haven in the United States when their plight moved the collective conscience of America, but the basic immigration law remained in place. Topic. Equal Nationality Act of 1934 This law allowed foreign-born children of American mothers and alien fathers who had entered America before the age of 18 and had lived in America for five years to apply for American citizenship for the first time. It also made the naturalization process quicker for the alien husbands of American wives. This law equalized expatriation, immigration, naturalization, and repatriation between women and men. However, it was not applied retroactively, and was modified by later laws, such as the Nationality Act of 1940. <laughs> Tidings McDuffie Act In 1934, the Tidings McDuffie Act provided independence of the Philippines on July 4, 1946. Until 1965, national origin quotas strictly limited immigration from the Philippines. In 1965, after revision of the immigration law, significant Filipino immigration began, totaling 1,728,000 by 2004. Post-war immigration In 1945, the War Brides Act allowed foreign-born wives of U.S. citizens who had served in the U.S. armed forces to immigrate to the United States. In 1946, the War Brides Act was extended to include the fiancés of American soldiers. In 1946, the Loose Cellar Act extended the right to become naturalized citizens to those from the newly independent nation of the Philippines and to Asian Indians, the immigration quota being set at 100 people per year per country. At the end of World War II, regular immigration almost immediately increased under the official national origins quota system as refugees from war torn Europe began immigrating to the U.S. After the war, there were jobs for nearly everyone who wanted one, when most women employed during the war went back into the home. From 1941 to 1950, 1,035,000 people immigrated to the U.S., including 226,000 from Germany, 139,000 from the U.K., 171,000 from Canada, 60,000 from Mexico, and 57,000 from Italy. The Displaced Persons Act of 1948 finally allowed the displaced people of World War II to start immigrating. Some 200,000 Europeans and 17,000 orphans displaced by World War II were initially allowed to immigrate to the United States outside of immigration quotas. President Harry S. Truman signed the first Displaced Persons DP Act on June 25, 1948, allowing entry for 200,000 DPs, then followed with the more accommodating Second DP Act on June 16, 1950, allowing entry for another 200,000. This quota, including acceptance of 55,000 Volksdeutschen, required sponsorship for all immigrants. The American program was the most notoriously bureaucratic of all the DP programs and much of the humanitarian effort was undertaken by charitable organizations, such as the Lutheran World Federation as well as other ethnic groups. Along with an additional quota of 200,000 granted in 1953 and more in succeeding years, a total of nearly 600,000 refugees were allowed into the country outside the quota system, second only to Israel's 650,000. Topic: 1950s In 1950, after the start of the Korean War, the Internal Security Act barred admission of communists, who might engage in activities which would be prejudicial to the public interest, or would endanger the welfare or safety of the United States. In 1950, the invasion of South Korea by North Korea started the Korean War and left a war ravaged Korea behind. There was little U.S. immigration due to the national origin quotas of the immigration law. 
Significant Korean immigration began in 1965 after revision of the law, totaling 848,000 by 2004. In 1952, the McCarran-Walter Immigration Act affirmed the national origins quota system of 1924 and limited total annual immigration to one-sixth of one percent of the population of the continental United States in 1920, or 175,455. This exempted the spouses and children of U.S. citizens and people born in the Western Hemisphere from the quota. In 1953, the Refugee Relief Act extended refugee status to non-Europeans. In 1954, Operation Wetback forced the return of thousands of illegal immigrants to Mexico. Between 1944 and 1954, the decade of the wetback, the number of illegal immigrants coming from Mexico increased by 6,000%. It is estimated that before Operation Wetback got underway, more than a million workers had crossed the Rio Grande illegally. Cheap labor displaced native agricultural workers, and increased violation of labor laws and discrimination encouraged criminality, disease, and illiteracy. According to a study conducted in 1950 by the President's Commission on Migratory Labor in Texas, the Rio Grande Valley cotton growers were paying approximately half of the wages paid elsewhere in Texas. The United States Border Patrol aided by municipal, county, state, federal authorities, and the military, began a quasi-military operation of the search and seizure of all illegal immigrants. Fanning out from the lower Rio Grande Valley, Operation Wetback moved northward. Initially, illegal immigrants were repatriated through Presidio because the Mexican city across the border, Ojinaga, had rail connections to the interior of Mexico by which workers could be quickly moved onto Durango. The forces used by the government were relatively small, perhaps no more than 700 men, but were augmented by border patrol officials who hoped to scare illegal workers into fleeing back to Mexico. Ships became a preferred mode of transport because they carried illegal workers farther from the border than buses, trucks, or trains. It is difficult to estimate the number of illegal immigrants that left due to the operation—most voluntarily. The INS claimed as many as 1,300,000, though the number officially apprehended did not come anywhere near this total. The program was ultimately abandoned due to questions surrounding the ethics of its implementation. Citizens of Mexican descent complained of police stopping all Mexican-looking people and utilizing extreme police state. Methods including deportation of American born children who were citizens by law, the failed 1956 Hungarian Revolution, before being crushed by the Soviets, forged a temporary hole in the Iron Curtain that allowed a burst of refugees to escape, bringing in 245,000 new Hungarian families by 1960. From 1950 to 1960, the U.S. had 2,515,000 new immigrants with 477,000 arriving from Germany, 185,000 from Italy, 52,000 new arrivals from the Netherlands, 203,000 from the U.K., 46,000 from Japan, 300,000 from Mexico, and 377,000 from Canada. The 1959 Cuban Revolution led by Fidel Castro drove the upper and middle classes to exile, and 409,000 families immigrated to the U.S. by 1970. This was facilitated by the 1966 Cuban Adjustment Act, which gave permanent resident status to Cubans physically present in the United States for one year if they entered after January 1, 1959. Hart Seller Act This all changed with passage of the Hart Seller Act in 1965, a byproduct of the Civil Rights Revolution and a jewel in the crown of President Lyndon Johnson's Great Society programs. The measure had not been intended to stimulate immigration from Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and elsewhere in the developing world. Rather, by doing away with the racially based quota system, its authors had expected that immigrants would come from traditional. Societies such as Italy, Greece, and Portugal, places that labored under very small quotas in the 1924 law. The law replaced the quotas with preferential categories based on family relationships and job skills, giving particular preference to potential immigrants with relatives in the United States and with occupations deemed critical by the U.S. Department of Labor. After 1970, however, following an initial influx from European countries, immigrants from places like Korea, China, India, the Philippines, and Pakistan, as well as countries in Africa became more common. Hart 
Topic: 1980s. In 1986, the Immigration Reform and Control Act was passed, creating, for the first time, penalties for employers who hired illegal immigrants. IRCA, as proposed in Congress, was projected to give amnesty to about one million workers in the country illegally. In practice, amnesty for about three million immigrants already in the United States was granted. Most were from Mexico. Legal Mexican immigrant family numbers were 2,198,000 in 1980, 4,289,000 in 1990 includes IRCA, and 7,841,000 in 2000. Adding another 12 million illegal immigrants of which about 80% are thought to be Mexicans would bring the Mexican family total to over 16 million. About 16% of the Mexican population. Immigration summary since 1830 The top 10 birth countries of the foreign-born population since 1830, according to the U.S. Census, are shown below. Blank entries mean that the country did not make it into the top 10 for that census, not that there is no data from that census. The 1830 numbers are from immigration statistics as listed in the 2004 Year Book of Immigration Statistics. The 1830 numbers list unnaturalized foreign citizens and does not include naturalized foreign born. The 1850 census is the first census that asks for place of birth. The historical census data can be found online in the Virginia Library Geostat Center. Population numbers are in thousands. Historical foreign-born population by state See also Anglo Demographics of the United States History of immigration to Canada Hyphenated American Guest worker program Melting pot Race and ethnicity in the United States. Topic: Ethnic groups. European Americans. Emigration from Europe. American Jews. Albanian Americans. Austrian Americans. Baltic Americans. Estonian Americans. Latvian Americans. Lithuanian Americans Belgian Americans British Americans English Americans Scottish Americans Welsh Americans Slavic Americans Belarusian Americans Bosnian Americans Bulgarian Americans Croatian Americans Czech Americans Macedonian Americans Montenegrin Americans Polish Americans Russian Americans Serbian Americans Slovak Americans Slovenian Americans Ukrainian Americans Scandinavian Americans Danish Americans Finnish Americans Icelandic Americans Norwegian Americans Swedish Americans Swedish emigration to the United States Armenian Americans Dutch Americans Flemish Americans French Americans Georgian Americans German Americans Greek Americans Hispanic and Latino Americans Hungarian Americans Irish Americans Italian Americans Luxembourg Americans Pennsylvania Dutch refers to German immigrants in colonial Pennsylvania Portuguese Americans Romanian Americans Spanish Americans Swiss Americans African immigration to the United States African Americans Central Africans in the United States Horn Africans in the United States North Africans in the United States Southeast Africans in the United States Southern Africans in the United States West Africans in the United States Middle Eastern Americans Afghan Americans Arab Americans 
Assyrian Americans, Azerbaijani Americans, Iranian Americans, Iraqi Americans, Kurdish Americans, Lebanese Americans, Saudi Americans, Syrian Americans, Turkish Americans, Asian immigration to the United States, Asian Americans, Bangladeshi Americans, Chinese Americans, Indian Americans, Japanese Americans, Korean Americans, Pakistani Americans, Filipino Americans, Vietnamese Americans, Pacific Islander Americans, Fijian Americans, French Polynesian Americans, Marshallese Americans, Maori Americans, Micronesian Americans, Palawan Americans, Samoan Americans, Tongan Americans, Hispanic and Latino Americans. <laughs>